sure I can see my notes here. So yeah, uh, this is the thesis defense. Yeah, so for the past few months, I've been, since middle of May, I've been working at Windesco, which is a wind farm power optimization company. So a lot of the things I'm actually doing here uh, and thinking about here are either applicable now or could soon be applicable to my work there, which has been an exciting transition to be making. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just dive in here. I, I don't know if there was anything else about the background of the last few months that you wanted me to include. All right, sounds good. But yeah, uh, this is my presentation on wind farm wake steering exploration during grid curtailment. A lot of these slides are gonna be pretty familiar to you all, so I'll try to sort of quickly go over the first few um, since I think those are pretty basic and probably well understood by now. So basically the problem with wakes is they reduce the power for turbines downstream as well as increasing loads. Uh, this is just an above, above view of this interaction that'll be uh, important to understand throughout this presentation. So individual wind, wind turbines follow a four region power curves. So basically depending on the incoming wind speed, the turbine aims to generate a certain amount of power. So when there's not very much wind, the blades pitch to 90 degrees, basically feathering the blades and not trying to catch any wind. And then once the wind reaches a cut in wind speed, uh, it goes to zero degrees blade pitch and tries to capture as much wind as possible. So uh, the cubic nature of this region two part of the curve is just due to the cubic amount of power uh, in wind as wind speed, uh, the power in the wind is a cube of the wind speed U. And then once it reaches region three, that's when the blades begin to pitch uh, at, a, at a certain angle to make sure that the rated power is maintained. The power is maintained at the rated power. And then once the wind speed goes past a certain threshold, the cutout wind speed, it's in region four and it goes back to pitching its blades to about 90 degrees. So in this presentation, I say 90 degrees, but uh, in reality, for an airfoil, it doesn't actually get uh, zero lift at 90 degrees. The, the actual number is maybe closer to 85 in practicality, or well, in actuality. So for the in-rail five megawatt wind turbine that's used, it's a paper turbine that only exists on, on paper. These are the specifications used for that turbine, which is also used throughout this research as well. So these just kind of give you a general idea of what sort of powers they kick in at, and then uh, the rated power five megawatts, as the name uh, as the name states, is what the rated power is, and that, that's a general naming convention for most turbines that their the rated power is connected to the name somehow. Uh, so weight steering mostly takes place in region two, as it's the only region where a change in wind speed can result in more power. Uh, basically, the derivative with respect to wind speed is zero in all other regions, so changing wind speed by weight steering uh, isn't effective for changing power. So basically, yeah, we're looking at region two for the rest of these research. So weight steering is a way to uh, make up for, make up for the wakes that I showed earlier. So this presentation focuses entirely on yaw-based wake steering due to its potential for widespread use. But Pretty much any utility scale wind turbine in existence is capable of yawing to some offset angle, in this case denoted by gamma, to deflect a wake as seen here. So uh, this method of steering a wake away from downstream turbines has shown potential for increasing the total farm power production in spite of decreasing the upstream turbines power output. Uh, other wake steering methods are not mentioned in this presentation, but still this uh, method of using curtailment times to explore different states uh, still could be useful for other wake steering methods. So uncertainty makes it hard to just wake steer at, to that gamma value I showed earlier. There's model uncertainty and sensor uncertainty. And with model uncertainty is basically just every model is making some assumption. It's not capturing the full nature of what's going on. Um, they can still be useful, of course, but they, they are, they're making assumptions and not being completely accurate. 
So there, there's lots of uh, fine details going on in wind wakes that aren't always captured by a mid-fidelity model like the one used in this research. And then, of course, there's often topography, hills, mountains, trees, buildings, whatever. Uh, things are changing in, uh, things are different from models in real life. And these things are also changing in time, like trees are growing, uh, grass is growing, that's affecting turbulence and such. Uh, there's also a sensor uncertainty, which basically these wind anemometers and wind vanes can be, uh, have a consistent offset and just be noisy in general. So that can make it hard to achieve the right wake steering angle. So basically model uncertainty makes it hard to predict the optimal wake steering angle and then this sensor uncertainty can make it hard to physically reach this predicted uh, gamma angle. And basically what this ends up doing to illustrate the difficulty of this, uh, we can see that if we measure the wind speed coming from this direction, we think we're, uh, we're steering the wake away. But if the actual wind is coming in from actually this direction, we're actually steering the wake directly into the downstream turbine. So having even a small amount of uncertainty can really make or break wake steering is sort of the general idea. So uh, mitigating the effects of the uncertainties from models and uncertainties from sensors is, is really important to make sure you can successfully wake steer. So uh, one of the things you could do is just go out onto a physical wind farm and try a bunch of different yaw angles for your upstream turbine and then see which of these yaw angles gives you the highest amount of power and say okay like when the wind is blowing at this direction have the yaw angle of the first turbine be 16 degrees and that'll give you the highest amount of power that this could there's a lot of reasons you wouldn't want to do this as i'm going to describe in further slides but first uh since i wasn't given a pair of two million dollar wind turbines to run real physical experiments on i need to take a detour to describe the model I used in place of the physical experiments. So the model I'm using is FastFarm, which is made by the National Wind Technology Center as part of NREL. And the software runs the OpenFast software for each individual turbine in the wind farm, and then which utilizes blade element momentum theory to uh, calculate forces, powers, and loads by taking these individual elements so that they can break down the three-dimensional physics of the, the wind farm into just a two-dimensional plane as shown here. And that's where you calculate this lift and drag based off of the incoming wind and the, the relative wind speed relative to the, the moving blade. So uh, Fast Farm itself also has a, a, it adds a wake model onto this open fast turbine model. Uh, it takes the ambient wind speed as input as well as, uh, yeah, and then calculates wake deficits behind the, the, tur the turbine. And then outputs wind velocities for the three-dimensional space of the wind farm. And uh, it, it's mostly based off of the dynamic wake meandering model, uh, the DWM model, which solves the thin shear layer approximation of Navier-Stokes equations to simulate uh, this quasi steady state deficit, which I think I was asked a couple of times, the quasi state wake deficit. It basically just means that this, there's this wake that's expressed here, which is if everything was going constant. And then there's uh, transients applied to this deficit itself, such as this meandering. Uh, and then that's what's fed into the entire array of wind. That we have. So we'll start off with just like this blade element momentum theory. The momentum part of it is making an assumption that momentum and mass is balanced going into the turbine as it is going out. Uh, basically the turbine isn't adding mass to the this stream. So for, but as the, the velocity is decreasing, that means the stream tube has to increase to be able to uh, still hold all of the mass that's coming in. So yeah, the, the stream tube is expanding under these assumptions. And then you can also see the, the pressure difference be before and after this disk. 
uh, and that's just due to that in this model, the actuator disk model, as it's called, treats the turbine as just a simple porous disk. And that's how, uh, yeah, so that causes this decrease in pressure and then this drop in wind speed. And this takes place in this near wake region. And then in the far wake region, it's a more consistent Gaussian uh, distribution, as I'll show here. So the, the, the thin shear layer approximation of Navier-Stokes equations gives a Gaussian far wake profile for wake deficits. However, this near wake region is not a Gaussian profile. Uh, our assumptions of the porous disk uh, aren't really accurate to real life just because turbines are not porous disks. So there has to be a near wake correction applied at this turbine disk uh, to account for what's actually happening here, that there's a higher velocity right at the, the wind tower, well, the wind turbine's tower in the cell. And that just makes it non-Gaussian. So th this correction uh, helps the far wake have a more spread out Gaussian pattern instead of a tighter Gaussian pattern that would happen if it was just a porous disk. And then uh, meandering is applied to that quasi steady state, uh, quasi steady wake from the slide before. And this meandering, it basically just, uh, it finds eddies larger than two turbines in diameter in the input wind flow field that is given. And uh, when these are low frequency eddies as well, uh, they treat the quasi steady state wake as a passive tracer for the largest dominant eddy that's found in the wind flow, which causes this meandering. And also this, uh, the model also uses a low pass filter, a single pole low pass filter applied at the rotor plane uh, that accounts for some of the inertia of the wake that it doesn't just change exactly when the wind turbine changes. And then this, this flow itself, this low pass flow travels downstream as shown here at these, at these time steps. Yeah. So then kind of one of the, the juicier parts of the fast farm wake model is just being able to do wake deflection. So by modeling each wake profile at parallel to this actuator disk, each profile has a velocity component in this radial direction R. So this velocity enables this uh, wake flow to be deflected to the side. And then the, the velocity, these velocities eventually recover to free stream. So you see this uh, wake eventually start going in the same direction as the free stream velocity. So that's how the, the wake is deflected in this model. So basically a summary of what goes on for the input for fast farm. We use a, a smooth eight meter per second hub height wind speed which uh, is adjusted at, at higher, higher than hub height, it's going quicker and lower than hub height, it's going slower as the power law would state for increasing wind speeds as height increases. Uh, so this just shows a horizontal slice of wind at hub height is what this red box is. And then the model calculates wake deficits based off of turbine operations, and makes the deficits its meander as shown before. And then uh, the smooth eddyless profile though, uh, since there's no large eddies, there's gonna be no meandering in what's actually shown here. That was just kind of one of the, the simplifications I made uh, feeding into this model to make things a little more clear uh, since this is just a proof of concept to start off for. Uh, so yeah, that's just why no meandering is observed in this output here, at the bottom right. So yeah, that just about sums it up. That fast farm was used, and there's a simple two turbine wind farm as shown was what was simulated. And yeah, this upstream turbine's yaw was varied to find the angle that maximizes total farm power. 
So these physical experiments find this optimal yaw angle. Uh, what I showed before, I showed you this slide before, which just says, oh, try a bunch of different yaw angles, find the power. Uh, there, there's a few risks to this. Uh, mostly it's just you're going to be generating less power uh, if you explore to many of these yaw angles, which are actually not going to increase power. Um, there's going to be stress on turbine one and stress in turbine two as it gets fed a weird wake profile and turbine one is yawing. So that can increase stresses as well. So just my thesis is kind of getting this data without, while mitigating some of these risks. So this method that I'm going to be describing is utilizing grid curtailment uh, as a remedy for some of the, the risks of physical yaw exploration. So typical grid operation requires the supply of electricity to meet the demand, as shown here, that the light bulbs are the demand supply given by uh, these power plants. Uh, but sometimes the demand decreases. Uh, causing a need to curtail one of these plants. And one of the possible ways out of many is to just pitch the turbine blades to produce less power. There's a, a lot of other different ways to curtail the amount of power going in. And there's a lot of other reasons just besides changes in demand that would cause you to want to produce less electricity than you're capable, be capable of doing. Uh, one of the examples I'm actually seeing in the real world now at my job is that some wind farms have to cap the amount of power they produce just because of the infrastructure and power lines and transformers that they're feeding wind into. So I'm actually seeing that there's a lot more turbines, a lot more farms that are curtailed in the real world than just the ones that are waiting for changes in demand here. So yeah, the gist of the thesis can be broken down to, into is, uh, can we use this curtailment time to find the optimal yaw uh, angle, and then apply that to uh, times when we're not curtailing, times when we want to produce as much power as possible, and this yaw angle could actually help you produce uh, more power, is the gist of this thesis. So curtailment itself allows experiments with fewer risks, and what do these actually look like? It starts off with normal operation, and then the downstream turbine curtails by pitching its blades to keep the wind farm power at a constant level. And then uh, step three is the upstream turbine explores different yaw states while the downstream turbine keeps the farm power balanced at a certain demanded uh, power output. So this decrease, decreases the, the risks of less power generated in the wind farm. And also since the downstream turbine is pitching its blades, there's less stress on the second turbine as well. So that's just two, two benefits of this method. So how do we actually measure, how do the measurements taken during a curtailment exploration uh, transfer to the uncurtailed operation? So the, the upstream turbine and the, the wake produced are actually the same whether the farm is in curtailed or uncurtailed operation. And then the, the wake profile, yeah, it, the wake profile is the same, uncurtailed or uncurtailed. And I'm using this ruler to, to just show that this is the measured experiment. And then down, down here is what we want to predict. So the, the only really thing that's different is the power of the uncurtailed, uh, the only difference is the power of the uncurtailed downstream turbine. So we, we know this in the measured curtailed experiment, but we don't know it in this uncurtailed experiment, well, in this uncurtailed uh, operation that we want to predict. So power output can be denoted, can be written as like the power of the wind uh, and the efficiency of the wind turbine capturing that power from the wind. The efficiency, uh, is expressed as a power coefficient, CP, which is a function of blade pitch angle beta and the turbine's tip speed ratio lambda. So first, let's start off by just finding the power of the wind first, since that should be the same in both. So power in the wind can be denoted as this one half 
air pressure, well, air density rho times turbine swept area A times the cube of wind speed uh, here. So, but this, this wind speed can be actually difficult to measure because these sensors, as I expressed earlier, are often inaccurate since the blades are directly influenced by wind speed. Well, the, the blades directly influence the wind speed measurement on the nacelle. So it can be more accurate to use a rotor effective wind speed to see what the turbine is actually feeling uh, via the torque it's via the torque it's feeling. So yeah, that's the rotor effective wind speed. Uh, and that can be found simply by expanding the power equation as shown before. But, uh, pow the power in the wind is expressed as this rho area wind speed cubed times the CP. And let's go ahead and express this tip speed, tip speed ratio lambda as tip speed of the wind turbine divided by wind speed. And then you can see from this equation, the only unknown is this wind speed measurement, assuming that we have a, a CP table from a model or uh, experiments or data from an active turbine. And yeah, we already know the power produced by this turbine. So yeah, the only unknown is wind speed and we can find we can solve for wind speed by simply, uh, in this equation, numerically solving. We basically just increase the value of u in this equation until everything is balanced. Oh, yeah, that's, that finds this rotor effective wind speed. So now that we found the, the power in the wind for this uh, uncurtailed operation that we want to predict, we also want to find the efficiency of the turbine power coefficient. So for the in real five megawatt turbine on paper, the, its efficiency is 48% as shown here at, when the blade pitch is pitched to zero and the lambda tip speed ratio is 7.55. But uh, tracking errors can make this hard to achieve in practice. So uh, we're gonna come back to this. We're gonna, we're gonna adjust this actual, oops, sorry about that. We're gonna adjust this actual uh, power coefficient a few slides from now. So yeah, now that I've shown how to predict how much power turbine two would produce in an uncurtailed state, let's see how this actually turns out on the graphs here. So while running the curtailment experiment, turbine two's power is measured at each upstream yaw angle as shown in the green dots. So this is the changing in yaw angle for the upstream turbine. And this power, these green dots for the power is the downstream turbine power. So this is what we actually measure. And then we're gonna try to predict what would be happening if this wasn't pitching its blades, but it was keeping it a zero degree blade pitch. And so the X's are our predictions and the circles are the actuals. So that you can see that they're, they're a little bit off, but we're gonna apply a correction here. Since we know that this first, uh, this first circle is actually a known quantity. It, it, uh, it occurs when this blade angle is zero, uh, which is something that happens often in, in turbine operation. So we can use this point to actually calibrate these X points. And that, that basically just means correcting the downstream turbine CP value. Originally we said it was 48%, but we're gonna adjust that to like uh, 45%, which gives, it calibrates this first dot here, and then gives a pretty good fitting for the rest of these predictions as well. So when we apply these downstream turbine powers to the total farm power, we're able to get a, a pretty decent prediction here as well. This actually predicts that the optimal yaw angle would be about uh, 14 degrees when uh, in actuality it was gonna be 16 degrees. So it's, it's a pretty close fit here. So the, the findings overall is that grid curtailment periods can offer viable experimentation time for wake steering with reduced financial and mechanical risks. And it likely doesn't require any additional sensors or actuators. Most utility scale wind turbines already have uh, yaw sensors as well as, um, yeah, yaw control and blade pitch control. And two major limitations to this research uh, would be the CP tables, that you require a CP table. This is the only part of my experiments in my thesis where I'm, relying on a model that there, a model would actually be applied um, to make the experiments transfer to what we want to predict. 
So finding an accurate CP table, as I'm going to express uh, later on here, is one thing that we could do to for future research to see if you can actually find CP tables that could be consistently used. And uh, another limitation is just inc inconsistent winds are one of the biggest limitation for wake steering in general, that you can try to wake steer, but if the winds change, uh, you're not gonna be steering the wake the way you want to anymore. So that's a limitation for wake steering in general, but my method in itself can actually help give us this sort of wake steering success percentage, um, which is basically saying, okay, like you have, you see this incoming wake profile, in, incoming wind profile, and you think it can wake steer, and it's been shown that you can wake steer successfully, but how often does that incoming wind change in a way that, that makes it to where your wake steering isn't actually successful uh, when you've started wake steering? So I, I kind of like to separate that this is kind of one of the more, most consistently asked questions of wake steering is like, okay, what happens when the winds change in velocity, direction, turbulence, whatever? And, and that's, a, that's a definitely a limitation for wake steering, but I think if we start thinking of it as like a success percentage for every time we wake steer, uh, we can actually get a better idea of wake steering, of whether wake steering is viable for a given wind farm and uh, just how much power it would actually increase for the wind farm. So I, I think that's where my method can actually uh, find the success percentage without the risks that um, I mentioned before. So yeah, but one future research idea would be to find a CP table. Uh, yeah, and, and other research ideas would be to use other times when turbines are intentionally working less efficiently uh, as described in uh, region three and region, well, yeah, region three is a time when the turbine is intentionally uh, acting less efficiently. So that's a possible future research idea is to look at region three instead of just region two curtailment. And then uh, I mentioned the CP tables, being able to find these CP curves and make CP tables accurately uh, would be a, a challenging and important future work idea. And, but a big question is, is the turbine's anemometer consistent enough? And uh, the anemometer itself is only taking the wind speed in one point, and wakes are three-dimensional in nature, affecting uh, the 2D plane of the downstream wake, so it's uh, of the downstream turbine. So how much can that one point that the an anemometer is measuring, how, how much can that, get, that give you an idea of the entire turbine's, what wake it's seeing from the upstream turbine? Also analyzing loads and how that uh, turns into money uh, is gonna be an important, it's just an important topic in wake steering research field in general right now. Because uh, it's a challenging problem and it can also vary from turbine to turbine, farm to farm, depending on uh, just the mechanics of these, uh, how these blades are made to, yeah, just lots of things. So. Uh, it's a challenging topic, but it's also important to assess that risk that I mentioned earlier, that where the, the, the loads are changing based on whether you're doing this exploration during curtailment periods or uncurtailed periods. And of course, another future work idea is scaling up from a two turbine wind farm to three turbine wind farm and saying, okay, what would be, be the ideal uh, way to operate this wind farm during a curtailment period to find these optimal yaw angles for these upstream turbines. There's some times when you could use an entire row of turbines to curtail the farm while allowing downstream turbines to not have to curtail at all. So in this case, this is actually an interesting scenario because this turbine not curtailing means that this row of turbines is actually behaving exactly as it would in the curtailed case versus the uncurtailed case. So you wouldn't need a, you wouldn't need to rely on a CP table at all for this scenario uh, or any sort of models. You'd just be able to apply exactly what you found in this experiment to all uncurtailed times. So yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to yeah, Pete for advising me over the years and so many of the NREL and NWTC researchers that made all of these uh, 
models and such possible. And then Windesco, my current employer, is, is um, you know, letting me take the day off to do my master's thesis as well. So, and of course, the conference organizers who allowed me to present this work in the American Controls Conference. And of course, the National Science Foundation for giving me funding to pursue this research as well. So if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please let me know. Great, thanks, Jordan. Thank so I guess we'll open it up for questions. Um, maybe we'll start with Michaela since he's the faculty of that we're hosting from outside the department, I guess. I assume you can hear me well. Um, sometimes I heard um, some was going. When when you mentioned the need to have. Sorry, you're cutting out a lot for me, so I'm not able to understand. Uh, um, can you? Mm, I, I, yeah, it's maybe a lot dropping out a lot. Maybe maybe we'll let um, Ryan go first, and then you can yeah. you can type a question into the chat window, and then I'll kind of moderate it. Uh, if you're you you can start with Ryan while I go on my iPad, which. Okay. It works better. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, sure. So I'll start with pretty simple. Um, going back to the very, very beginning. Yep. I'll start showing some plots, uh, not plots, but like kind of those graphics where uh, you have some wake steering. Um, yeah, anyone. Sure, like, yeah. Yep. Sure. So again, I mean, not as a non fluids person, you know, what are the colors here? Uh, it just kind of shows. This was actually taken from a, a different wind farm model florus that basically the colors are just showing that there's differences in wind speed throughout uh, the wake, even whether it's at the center of the wake or farther out. So basically uh, this bluer section is going to be a larger wake deficit and then the yellow is just a, a, a less wake deficit so it's going faster out here and typically slower in the middle. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Um... And on the same concept, again, understanding that my, ba my background is non fluids, could you give me some intuition as to like how wake steering actually works? Like, well, why does changing, you know, the angle of the turbine change the direction of the wake? Just can you explain yeah. that like, in simple terms that, you know, I'd really be able to understand? So basically, yeah, the, this turbine is kind of just acting as, you know, a wall. Like these, these blades are sort of just walls. You could think of that. And then as the wind hits this blade, it gets, this wall is giving a force back onto the wind, right? So, you know, Newton's, Newton's uh, force balancing. Uh, and then part of that vector is down into the left, right? Or this wall is applying a force down into the left on this wind. Uh, and part of that downward vector is what causes this to deflect uh, downward in this slide. And then, yeah, away from the downstream turbine. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, um, could you, so you, you've talked through this presentation of like, you know, there are many challenges here. There's a lot of uncertainties in the model and the sensors, and it seems like all those together could have pretty big effects on the end result, right? Yes. Um, so could you, I mean, I'd be interested in kind of going through a couple of those at least in, understanding better like the magnitude of these uncertainties and like you know how devastating an effect they could have on the results you're generating here um so i mean i'll, I'll, I'll focus on a couple and we don't have to go through all of them but like for example you talked about how the analysis you're doing here does not take into account like time varying um like incoming velocities right it's kind of all of your analysis is like a uniform yeah there's a smoothed over and, yeah, and that, that causes like problems in like a kind of like time varying wake and that, and, and that's something so you talked about that at some point in the model. Like, is, is that, you know, is that going to really cause like huge effects, especially like in the deviation of the wake kind of like, um, like, is it going to change like meters kind of like in, and, and is that really going to just like the uncertainty from just that alone, but that wash out really any optimization like you would run? So you, your question is like, if this incoming profile wasn't just this red blob, yeah. if it was actually just a normal wind, 
profile. Yeah, so, so like that third diagram at the bottom on the left of your slide. Yeah. So yeah. Like, like how far could those deviations be? Like, are they like, you know, a, you know, a small percentage of like a turbine diameter? Is it like, could it be like four diameters? Like, in diameters, like is there like a rough order of magnitude on like what would be reasonable there under like realistic conditions? Hmm. So they, they would have to be at least larger than one diameter. Let me think. So you're saying what would be a reasonable deviation here? So I mean, it's, it's okay if you don't know the answer, but I mean, yeah, I. I I've seen some simulations that do, you know, it of course have this wake meandering and i think what i i can't give you an exact idea of like how many diameters it would deflect on but i think to get back to your 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 overall question here is just saying like okay if there's going to be wake meandering in a real wind flow even if you could predict like the exact wind like the exact turbine angle to yaw at and could predict that you were going to get there because there wasn't any sensor uncertainty would this still make it to where wake steering wasn't viable is sort of your overall question. Yeah. And basically, I, I think that there's, there's actually been a lot of research that does do use wake steering on higher fidelity models, as well as there's been wake steering done by one of the Stanford papers was in a real wind farm. And they were able to show that wake steering was actually uh, possible to increase farm power for the entire farm. So I, I think to go back to your major question, I, I don't think that this meandering is either big enough or, could, or or a high enough magnitude to make it to where wake steering isn't viable, just based off of my idea of what's, what's in the literature, uh, based off of large eddy simulations, higher fidelity simulations, and then what's also been done in real life wind farm simulations. If that makes sense. Okay. I mean, so so I guess the last follow up on that is, if you were to continue looking at using something like this in real life, would this be the main kind of thing that you'd have to investigate next to really make sure that this is, you know, beneficial? Like, like is this, you know, moving forward, is this like the biggest, you know, uh, source of uncertainty that you'd have to address? Um, I, I'm going to say no, just because of what I've seen from sensor uncertainty in wind farms, both uh, before starting my job and then after starting my job, not on this slide, sorry about that. Um, just how much uncertainty is going into here, it's like looking at the wake meandering, that can be sort of like reduce the effects of wake steering, but if your sensor uncertainty is like 10 degrees off from the direction the wind is actually coming in from, that that's that's a make or break for whether wake steering works at all. So I I would say the sensor uncertainty is still currently the biggest challenge for actually applying wake steering. Uh, okay, yeah. So I mean that that's yeah. actually what I was gonna go to next. Um, so is that really the magnitude that you'd be dealing with in real life of uncertainty, like ten degrees? Yeah, that, definitely on the older turbines for sure. It can vary whether the turbines are. Uh, newer or older of course because some of the newer ones have setups where they're using two two wind vanes and they're just averaging out the number and then it can eventually get close to where the wind is actually coming in from you also have to apply sort of uh, an offset for the way the blades are rotating since the blades are only rotating clockwise uh, that changes the velocity of the wind in a direction that also affects the wind vane so th there's offsets you can apply there so the newer turbines are applying those offsets and they have more wind vanes and uh, they're just being more calibrated is something that my job is actually doing right now is calibrating uh, wind farm wind vane sensors basically. So there's ways of counteracting that and the newer wind farms are doing better at this certain sensor uncertainty. And then I think from there, once those sensors are more precisely pointed in the wind direction, I think then we would start worrying about, okay, like how much is meandering uh, making it too hard to wake steer? And I think that kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier uh, in my conclusions was just that what if we find, not this finding, sorry about that. 
finding this like success percentage for wake steering. Let, let's say you have, sorry, as I find my slides there. Um, yeah, let's say you do have this meandering going on. Um, how much turbulence means that there's enough meandering that you can't efficiently wake steer, right? So if if there's enough, you if you find like the, I think what you're saying also comes down to just how turbulent the incoming wind is. And there's gotta be a point when the incoming wind is turbulent enough that this meandering does actually make it to where wake steering isn't viable and so yeah, I, I think that sort of gets back to your point here that like, even if we have the most accurate sensors, there's gonna be some inflows, even if they're coming at the right direction, but they might be too turbulent to make work. Sure, but I mean, based on the number you just told me, it sounds like the sensor uncertainty is actually a much more dominant effect currently. Yes, for sure. Um, so can you just go to a slide where you actually have your kind of optimized total power? like as a function of uh, the yaw, the steering angle. Yeah. So something like this? Yeah, so I mean, this brings me back to like, I mean, this plot, like, it's, like, I mean, if your optimal is like 14, 15, and, you know, your measurement's 10 degrees off, like, it does, It seems like that really is, like, something you got to worry about, right? Oh, for sure, yeah. And for wake steering in general, for sure, you, you if you don't have an accurate enough yaw, like yaw direction, winds direction sensor, yeah, it's, it's make or break for this. So that's definitely one of the reasons why you, you'd want to, if you could run a physical experiment and get physical data for this individual turbine, you'd be able to sort of characterize, okay, like this turbine is off by five degrees. Uh, so, 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 so then is it, um, when, you, when you talk about this uncertainty in the, in that sensor, is it more of like a kind of like a bias, like a cal like a constant offset, or is it, are we talking like one sigma every instance in time, it could be like 10 degrees in any direction? Yeah, so typically it is a constant bias, but of course with any sensor you're also going to have that sigma noise. I'm not as experienced on how exactly that noise what sort of frequencies that noise goes into, but yeah, there, there's definitely, it's mostly characterized by a constant yaw sensor bias, which is often just because of the counter, well, the clockwise nature of the blades, making the flow come in from maybe a five to 10 degree offset to the sensor itself. Um, but yeah, typically it will be that constant bias. And I, I'm, I'm not sure enough to give you more more descriptions on whether how much that noise uh, would come into play? Right, no, no, that's fine. I mean, that, I mean, it sounds like if it's really a bias, there's more hope to kind of calibrate it out or estimate it or something. Yeah. And there are sensors like lidar sensors, which uh, can not only you know give the wind incoming wind profile as a two-dimensional plane, but it also can give a two-dimensional plane like away in front of the wind turbine, right? Like if, if it can give it just like, I don't know, 30 feet in front of the turbine, that's 30 feet more of, of, of time that you have to either correct the, the yaw angle or, or whatever, um, which isn't much, but anything counts. So Jordan, just to interrupt, I think Michaela yeah. is having trouble getting back into the meeting. So I don't know if you have to give them permissions or. Oh, okay. Uh, keep an eye out. I'm not seeing any. Maybe you could make me host in the meantime, which you're going to have to do anyways, and I could try to let him in while you were answering questions. So under, yeah. um, I think I just made you host if you. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think I'm host yet. Under manage participants, you can see my name, and then there's like a more button. Oh. Sorry, I just saw the H. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, okay, there we go. I think. We okay, cool. Sorry, Mikhail, I, I didn't see your... No, no, that's okay, that's okay, it's good. Um, 
Okay, can you hear me well now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry for all the mess. Um, uh, maybe maybe I, I missed some part of the discussion, so I would just uh, kind of ignore and ask my question. So, with the you mentioned that the turbine is a porous disc, it's treated as a porous mm -hmm. disc, but with the blade element model, you should be able to calculate the um, the, the the lift and drag force. Uh, given whatever angle the blade is oriented uh, and whatever flow is uh, is perceived so yeah. i guess the the second the cp is not required right i mean why why the cp is required it should be calculated based on the blade element model is that correct uh so you're saying instead of instead of using cp table use this blade element model and i i think that cp table that i'm using uh, is actually based off of the blade element model so i i think you you're on the right track there that like this but, would but give the second you turbine i i get it but the second turbine will feel a a, a different inflow depending on the yo of the first turbine mm, yeah so i think you have to go through the blade element model to get the correct power because each uh, depending on the steering of the wake of the first turbine the second turbine will have mm -hmm. let's say half of the rotor with the certain velocity half of the rotor with the other velocity and so that will be difficult to parameterize in the C in the cp it should it should recalculate basically the the torque and and omega i would i mean that's my 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 take on this but you you you, you know the models so I, I just wonder what, what is the best strategy there? Yeah, so definitely using a, a model-based CP it, that's calculated using blade element theory with a constant inflow, wind inflow, there's definitely an idea that like that CP wouldn't necessarily transfer to uh, an inflow that's not a consistent inflow, right? That's not homogeneous. Yeah. Um, I suppose in, in my, sorry, hopefully you don't see these emails coming in. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely more research to be done on seeing whether those CP tables are different depending on a heterogeneous wind inflow. Um, I mean, I wonder, is that part of the FAST package or this is something that should be developed uh, independently? I, I think it could be developed independently. I, I, think, I don't think it's part of the FAST package because I think with... Well, I, I suppose, I think with FAST you could, you know, you can put an inflow that is heterogeneous, right? That is different. And then from there, you'd be able to calculate CPs and such. So I, I suppose that could be done in the open fast package. Um, because that would be interesting if the, if the yeah. fast already provides the, the wake flow and even a dynamic wake flow, then, uh, then you can calculate whatever you need to calculate based on the, on, on the single, on the blade element. I, I, that, that's but again i'm not familiar with fast at all so this is my is is, is a is a question i have is not is, i don't know the answer yeah. so yeah i i i think you're on a good track here yeah we, we you could recalculate cp tables based off of heterogeneous nature of wind and flows I, I think that's something worth noting here as something you would add if you were trying to make a cp table like this like look at different okay. yeah look yeah. at different when it flows. And the, the second question I have, when you mentioned uh, that the wake provides, the, the FAST provides a uh, wake meandering dynamics. Yep. Um, is, uh, is the wake dynamic, I suppose that's model with some kind of pseudo number uh, or something. And I, I wonder, if, is, is that depending uh, on the yo angle or not? The, the weight meandering uh, shouldn't be not not dependent on yaw angle. 
so it's it's decoupled basically correct and and my honest curiosity is whether that's true or not and mm. i don't know also the answer whether the the the, the period of the wake man then it would depend on the on the yo angle because yeah it, okay. yeah that that i don't know again i wonder if if you thought about anything on along that direction uh, i hadn't thought about that but i think that's definitely viable just because when you're looking at The model definitely just treats it as a passive tracer, right? That this wake, well, mm -hmm. the wake that you produce here, it's passively modeling that meandering. But I think with the way that these pressure gradients work out, I think that would, like, when it's, this pressure gradient's gonna look different when you yaw the turbine, right? Um, yeah. So I think that would have a role in how it interacts with that, the larger eddies. I mean, yeah, the, the the reason I'm asking is because we we did some at some point we did some experiment with the highway sign, and we we saw some fluctuation mm, of the yeah. loads, and uh, and we wonder whether the inclination of the highway sign will change a different will induce a different type of unsteadiness. And whether the, mm. the strudel number that is typically used for this this meandering oscillation that works also for wind turbine uh, can be set independently. Like typically, it would be a strudel number of 0 0.25 plus minus 0 0.02, 0 0.03. I wonder if that 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 is something that we can hold steady and say, okay, no matter what. Uh, that's defining the period of the of the oscillation, or whether that will depend also on the on the yawing of the turbine. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and again, I don't I don't know. That's why I'm asking. I mean, yeah, I'm familiar with that highway sign research actually. So that's. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, I think that's a good question overall, and I, I think it would. I, I think the angle the yaw angle would have some sort of effect on the oscillation and th that some of these assumptions that it's acting just like a passive tracer yeah I, I think some of that wouldn't hold true for a more accurate model but i'm not entirely sure what to say from there i'm, I'm not uh, yeah, yeah yeah i'm i'm i had this question in the past and i'm, I'm not sure if we we I don't know how it works for turbines, actually. So mm. I, it, it depends also probably on the range of a yaw. If it's a small range of angles, probably it's not much affected. Mm. Uh, uh, so, so probably for wind turbines, for the range of yaw angle you would use for an optimization, which you, you were saying about 10, 15 degree, probably it doesn't matter that much, I, I would suspect but but yeah that was just curiosity yeah um yeah i don't have i don't have any other okay. questions uh mazir you have any questions so well, i've got a few um i guess i just wanted a clarifying question i think you put it in there for me in the first place but the fast farm um you were mentioning there's this quasi steady aspect. I, I don't think I fully followed what was going on in there. I know it's not central to everything you did. It's just the model that you're using. But can you, I guess the thing that's confusing me a little bit here is that you're looking at something that's transient, but then you're saying that there's something quasi steady there. And so like to me, when you do something quasi steady, there's no transient. It's just like a step, step function. So can you, Walk me through this just one more time on what exactly is going on here on the yeah on the so model yeah so so at this rotor disc when it produces one of these profiles it treats that that profile as sort of like a steady wake deficit and that wake deficit um, the way it's characterized it's sort of 
propagates downstream in a consistent way, regardless of like the changes in wind speed or, uh, and that, that forms like this wake deficit here. Mm -hmm. And this is like sort of considered steady state that like, uh, it's this deficit that's meandered in real time and transients. Um, this deficit is bent to make this meandering. I don't, I don't, let me see if I can word this in a different way. Uh, so in the blade element momentum theory, oh, I, I guess, so I, I understand uh, the middle picture that you have there and, yeah. I understand the, the top picture that you have. I guess what I don't understand is how you get that meandering effect that kind of, because that looks unsteady to me. Now you said that there's this like, it's treated like a passive scalar in some sense. So you're somehow moving the okay. deficit along with some local velocity field, but I don't know where that local velocity field's coming from if it was uniform. Yeah. So yeah, that, 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 those large eddies would typically come from whatever input uh, wind profile you you put in here, but since I smoothed it out, that's why there's no meandering. And, and what you're saying there, yes, this meandering is transient. So oh, it's, oh it's I see. Sort of, okay, okay. Yeah. So the picture so, on the bottom is if you didn't have that red blob on the top right here, yeah, you had some local eddies, it would just follow that as a passive scalar, right? Yes. Okay, I, I think I understand what's going on now. Okay. Um, all right, and then you kind of answered this at the end of your talk, but while you were presenting it, I had this question about the CP tables. Um, so you use the CP table to sort out what is the wind speed. Yep. Once you have the wind speed, you go back to your CP table to sort out what is the optimal positioning to maximize power, right? For that given wind speed. Yeah, and, yes. Yeah. And I guess my question is, so assuming you had no other sources of uncertainty, how accurate does this table need to be? Because you said like you need an accurate table. Mm. How accurate does that need to be for the things you're you're trying to achieve? You have a sense for that? And like, so I want to go out and build this table. I want to know how much resolution do I need? Do I have to grid it up very finely? How many experiments do I need to run to build this table? Do you have a sense for the accuracy you need in that table? So let's see if I can go back to this this chart where I was saying that the CP value was 48% instead of 45%. You actually do see like you know the, the power is higher of course because it's higher efficiency. So that would shift these predictions, right? And you then all of a sudden you would get like different You, would, you might get a different angle here is sort of what I'm getting at. So mm -hmm. if your CP table wasn't accurate within, I think 3% of what that CP would actually be, I think, I think it's safe to say your angle would be different, but to get like a, a feeling for how different that would be, hmm, like, And then just go, to go back to the CP calculation here, like this blade pitch is pretty well known, right? So you're, you're mostly basing this off of like tip speed and whatever wind speed was used to calculate that part of the CP table. So I, 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 it really would come down to like, how would you ever get this wind speed if you didn't have a CP table? Of course, in my model, I'm, I have the wind speed because it was in a simulation. It was found through the aerodyne aerodynamics module of open fast. Um, so in the field, you'd probably have to use like an anemometer as I, as I was talking about in the conclusion, which I think you were, your part of your question was like, if your sensors were accurate or, or 
Well, I, I guess ignore it. Like, so you were asked questions about uncertainty, other sources of uncertainty by Professor Caverly. So I'm just asking, like, if you ignore all those other sources of uncertainty, yeah. So the CT oh, table yeah. seems to be pretty okay. important for your approach, right? Or at least yes. some way of sorting out how do you relate pressure to your yaw angle and also to your wind speed. So how accurate of a calculation do you need there for this to, I guess maybe my question is actually poorly posed because you don't have a requirement right now on like the um, the band you need within the uncertain or within the optimal, but I guess there's a trade off, right? If you have, if you have less certainty in the CP table, you're going to get less um, gain out of this, right? Yeah, I, I think it sort of depends on a few other parameters too. Like if if this CP changes, well, if, if the CP changes to to make this uh, prediction, right? It's gonna change this curve, these predictions as well. And that's gonna change this optimal yaw angle that we predict, but is it, it's still gonna, in this scenario, it's still going to predict that there's some yaw angle out here that is more efficient than zero degrees, right? So I, I think it's going to depend on other things as well, like exactly where you place the turbines, which is another parameter for exactly what wind direction is coming in. Um, so it's kind of like if my CP table was inaccurate in this estimation, it would still give me a yaw angle that's better than zero degree yaw angle, right? So it's it's kind of like, I don't think there's exactly a cutoff for how accurate or inaccurate your CP table could be and still give you a number. Um, That's it. It, it, does that sort of make sense that like, basically how accurate your CP table is, it's not gonna be, it's going to depend on the scenario, other parameters for whether the CP table is like a make or break for your prediction. Sure, no, that, that, that makes uh, sense. That it would be a function of that as well. Sure. So but it, there would be yeah. a cutoff because I wouldn't believe if I gave you a CP table that was completely wrong. Yeah. Then that's the, the true. Wouldn't look like this, right? But yeah. Okay. But I but I understand what you're saying. It's kind of dependent on the specific configuration of the wind and the turbines and all that so it, yeah that's mm, i i agree i mean that's that's one aspect that i i would as well i mean the cp table in your description for the downwind turbine includes uh, the variability of the wind within the rotor which makes it kind of challenging because it means your cp table the cp table you require has a has a very broad parameter space mm -hmm. Okay, so cool. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, no, 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 that's all my question. So, okay, Ryan, did you have any more questions? We kind of shifted away from you. I thought you were wrapped up, but I guess I'll give you one more chance. Uh, I pretty much was. I mean, okay. I just, one final question, I guess. Um, I mean, I think during the presentation, you touched on kind of. I mean, you, you could have presented this as your method that you've kind of come up with, right, to, to do this. Um, but just like in a really brief, like one or two bullet points, could you just kind of like highlight, like this is the one or two things that make what I did different than what anyone else has ever done? Yeah, so lots of research has looked at wake steering as a whole, uh, well, has looked at wake steering, and they've tried to find like, you know, optimal yaw angles and such. And there's been some research that's looked at curtailment periods to say, okay, like when turbines are curtailing, how can we operate them so that there's less, fewer loads in the, in the farm? But no research has ever looked at these curtailment periods and said, okay, is there anything I can learn from these curtailment periods, learn about how the, the wind is flowing in the, in the farm that could then be applied to wake steering in non-curtailed periods? Uh, so I've, I've kind of made a connection there between this, the, the curtailment periods and then wake steering itself that hadn't really been made. Um, it, it had somewhat been made for mitigating loads, perhaps. Uh, I think that's mostly been done through axial induction just by changing the blade pitch, but not actually through yawing turbines to mitigate loads. 
Um, so I think in, in that regard, that that's sort of two two ways that I've put something unique is like connecting uh, the way wakes move in curtailed periods to uncurtailed periods, and then also specifically looking at yaw, um, how yaw can do this for increasing power outputs in the uncurtailed times. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, thanks. I don't have any questions for you, Jordan, so I am going to put you in the waiting room, which oh, now yeah. that you made me host, I can do. So just hang out there and then we'll get back to you in just a few minutes, okay? Awesome, thank you.